First of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. In a special way, I would like to thank Mr. Bishop, Bishop Keiko, a very dear friend of mine who has been, who is my classmate in the seminary, who has been a brother to me for 30 years. About a year ago, he became a father to me, and he, he became a bishop. Along with Bishop Topoffer, have shown incredibly incredible fatherly care for me. Uh, also, my parents, my siblings are here. I want to thank them and the rest of you for being here. A friend of mine, Sarah Krasinski, came in after Mass, before Mass, excuse me, and said, Can you feel the love? And I thought she was going to start singing the chorus of Lion King, Can you? <laughs> but yes, I can feel the love. I have felt the love. And it's been incredible. 25 years of priesthood and 51 years of life where I felt that love. Um, I want to begin with just a little bit of a disclaimer, but a couple of stories first. When I first came here to Holy Family about three years ago, I almost said 30 years ago, but three years ago, uh, uh, I told a story of one of my first weekends here. And I didn't know the ushers called me to pick on him, so now I know them, so I'm going to pick on my friend Adolf. I told the story about priest who was trying to get across the point that our that our that the decisions and choices we make in this life have eternal consequences. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay. Let me know. Wait, raise your hand. Uh, and I used a story about this priest one Sunday at Mass and asked the entire congregation to stand. And they all stood. And he said, everybody wants who wants to go to heaven, please sit down. And everybody sat down, except the ushers because they were talking in the back of church. So preachers repeated it. Anybody who wants to go to heaven, sit down. All the ushers heard that, so they all sat down except one. My, my friend Adolf. He <laughs> remained standing. So, the priest decided, decided to get a little more obvious and said, Adolf, if you don't want to go to hell, sit down. <laughs> and Adolf yelled back, Father, I noticed you were the only one in church standing. <laughs> and I didn't want you to get lonely on the trip down. <laughs> you notice that I'm sitting when I tell that story today? <laughs> but I see all you in that who are standing. <laughs> also, another disclaimer, Father, Father Jacob, do not be impressed by his story of saving the island. I came home from a week with my parents. And this most beautiful orchid that Captain Motley had given me on the occasion of the ordination, I think of Bishop as we had a rehearsal dinner for the servers and the seminarians. Beautiful. I've kept it alive ever since then. I've come back completely dead. So, <laughs> anyways, don't be too impressed about his stories. I don't even know if it's true, but actually. I would like to, as I said in the beginning, I'd like to dedicate to this time we spent together. To Our Lady under the, the title of the Sorrowful Mother, standing at the foot of the cross. I have received an incredible consolation from so many of you, great healing because of your prayers, and incredible consolation from all of the saints, especially our Sorrowful Mother. I also want to give my thanks on behalf of my parents and my siblings for the incredible love that I've experienced uh, during this 10 years of the sickness. I've reached the end of life and I'm ready to encounter the Lord. Uh, I first of all want to make a disclaimer and a short history of the kind of cancer that I have, the sarcoma cancer. And that's cancer of the soft tissue. I've, I've seen my hospice doctors here, my nurse, my hospice nurse probably is here, but it's gone on for about 10 years. I asked Bishop Falcon for a sabbatical to live down in Guatemala with the poor in an orphanage, assist at a hospital that I've been supporting for the past 10 years. And while I was down there for two weeks, I got sick and was diagnosed with a tumor. Uh, I realized then, I thought I worked hard when I lived with the Franciscans who never had a dollar in their pocket, who never had a day off, who never took time for themselves, I realized. 
and I've been a fairly lazy freezer to that point. So they taught me a lot about the service of the poor and for those who are sick and suffering and preparing for death. When many in the orphanage and in the hospital died, the only people that showed up would be the sisters and the doctors who cared for them and the priests. No other family, because they were all orphans, would show up. But it was there that I came back and I was met at the, at the, at the, at the uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, words sometimes fail me. At the airport, by a dear friend of mine, Dr. Janine Griffin, and her husband, Dr. Paul, but now uh, Dr. Janine met me at the airport. Dr. Paul was waiting for me at home, ready to take me to the hospital in Port Baca. But before I got, once we got to our camp, I asked her to go through the lashes. More than anything, I wanted to stop at my parents' house. They didn't know I was sick and they didn't know I was coming. I wanted to stop and all I want to do is lay on my mother's lap just for a little while to be caressed and to be reminded it would, it would be okay. So we did that and I went to the hospital. From there, Dr. Bunnell got the, got the uh, advice of Dr. Andrew Clemens. From Dr. Clemens, I went on to eventually Dr. Dean Anderson, my doctor was there. All of them, from beginning to end, have been incredible people people of incredible faith, and it is something beautiful to have your doctors, and I'm going to continue to mention them because they were so wonderful to me, to tell me that they and their spouses and their children had been praying for me. From there, I went to Dr. Enrique Lopez Roman here as an oncologist, and from Dr. Lopez Roman to Dr. Ed Farrell, I went to Dr. Ty, Ty Meyer. Dr. Jim Newman had been instrumental in helping me understand those words that are this long that we know are in English, but are in medical terms that we simply don't understand. And it was wonderful about explaining those terms from MD Anderson Hospital to me. Uh, down to my dental care, Dr. Olasinski and Dr. Gary Fries, they took they have taken care of me for years and through all this have assured me of their prayers and prayers, not only the family, but so many of their staff offered me their prayers also. My disappointment for all to, in, in telling you all of that was that 10 years ago when I was diagnosed with this, the doctors told me, they were very honest with me, that this, this cancer would eventually get me. Uh, there was no cure for it. I'd go through a series of, of surgeries, which, which I did, and I would max out on surgeries because of scar tissue and the, the number of tumors and et cetera, et cetera. And then I would try some chemotherapy, which I did two different rounds. I tried some natural medicines. I tried, believe me, if it's out there, I tried it. And uh, now, now the doctors have told me, told me the day before Ash Wednesday from uh, Emmy Anderson that I had then six, less than six months to live. So now I'm down to less than four months to live. And I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about death, dying. And my original intention was heaven and hell, four the traditional four, four last things that the church, church teach about, teaches about, excuse me. But the, uh, when I visited with Father Jacob's class of university students, I visited with them about, they were more interested in death and dying. And I began to understand why. They were very committed young people. They were committed to their faith and they were committed to their Lord. So their eyes are fixed on heaven. And I think the same is true for all of you. You're, you're not far from heaven. You're living your faith as radically as you can. You're staying true to the sacraments. All of those things, because I know so many of you from so many different parts of the diocese. All of those doctors that I mentioned, and their nurses, and all the medical staff, and all the uh, people involved in social sciences, they could give this talk a whole lot better than I can. So I'm not here as an expert of um, death and dying. So many of you have buried your spouses, your parents, and unfortunately some of you have buried your children. So you know what it is to be at the bedside day and night of someone who is dying. I will not say anything to you that you have not already heard or experienced in your own personal life. So I claim no expertise whatsoever. The only thing I wanted to reflect on was eternal destiny and the intersection of faith, suffering, and the process of dying. So uh, we're going to do things a little differently tonight.
You know, we always tell you, don't use your cell phones in church. Today, we're going to teach you to use your cell phones in church. Uh, but keep the ringer off. And we have a number. If you want to text, it's going to be question and answers. But I have plenty prepared if you don't have any questions. Uh, you're, you're, do they have the number? Have they have the number on the card, and we have several questions already. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. One of the things that helps you make it through this is just a little bit of morphine and a lot of uh, rum. <laughs> hardships for the sake of the kingdom. And if you're not prepared for sacrifice and hardship, then you're not prepared for the work of the kingdom. Uh, then he went on to give us as examples how people find excuses to reject their crosses, who complain. And I got onto it after mass and I'll talk about my dirty laundry, you know. Uh, <laughs> I should be telling those stories from the record. Yes, the answer is yes. My faith has been shaken. There were two occasions. One was in the hospital when I've never had a panic attack, so I had my first panic attack. And it could have been the drugs, it could have been uh, you know, low depression, it could have been anxiety, it could have been anything. But I felt like the entire room was closing up as a casket. And my sister was next to me and I didn't want to disturb her and it was such a lonely feeling. And it didn't last very long and I, I wanted to go to confession right afterwards because I felt not the presence of God but the absence of God. Uh, as you know, priests and religious deacons have an obligation to pray every day. Even when we don't feel like praying, we're expected to pray. And there are a lot of times when I was sick and otherwise that I simply did not feel like praying. I knew God was there. That's been one of my most beautiful consolations, is that I've always known that God is there, save the exception of these two crises of faith. Uh, did I answer the question? Yes, she did. Okay, go on to the next question. <laughs> Do you offer your sickness for any particular cause, and has your personal understanding of redemptive suffering changed? Do you remember growing up, and you would go to your father and say, Dad, I'm bored. He said, go clean the garage and cut the yard while you're at it. <laughs> and you'd go to mom and mom, I'm bored. I don't know. And she would say, go do what your father says. So you tried a different strategy, and you say, Dad, I'm sick, you feel, go see your mom. And if we go to mom and mom say, I don't feel well, he said, offer it up and go clean the garage like your dad told me. <laughs> so there's been a very continuous religious practice of offering up our suffering in my family. It was part of our, our upbringing. Just a very quick story that before we would ever be allowed to go out and play, we were little bitty things. Remember the good old days when children actually went outside to play instead of having that little electronic device in front of them. When our parents would kick us out early in the morning and then bring us back late at night, they would, uh, <laughs> mother would say, you can't go out. You can't go out until you pray. And so we, there was, in the, in the hall, there was a picture, picture of the Sacred Heart up, up, up above it, but below it was her sewing machine. And I was young and dumb. And uh, I always thought I was praying to the sewing machine. <laughs> Realize that giant picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I really love that. Mama had six, no, my parents had six girls, so she was at that sewing machine a lot, so I thought she was cheating. But she would often tell us when we were sick, when we were suffering, to offer it up. And and I made that a priority during during this illness for the past 10 years. But it's that especially since being put on hospice, I've been offering the pains and sufferings, the anxiety. The fear I've been offering that up for some very specific intentions and some intentions that people have sent to me and some personal intentions that I have. Yes, and I'm beginning to see the fruit of that offering. 
Okay, this one is when you know someone has a limited time to live and you go to visit them, I find it hard to greet them. I don't know what to say. Say, hi, how are you? How have you been? What would you suggest on how to greet somebody in that situation? Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Once again, there's a little story involved in this, right? <laughs>
I said, this is the beauty of theology, the wonderful, the joy of theology is that we, we wonder about God's magnificence and we simply do not fully understand. God will always be beyond us and yet among us, within us. And he will also always be unknown to us, but not completely. So he's always saying some surprises to us. I think heaven's going to be one of those surprises. The best thing that I can compare it to is to be face to face with love. That when we become when we come before the throne of God, we will be overwhelmed with love. All of the things that weigh us down, the pettiness, the anger, the bitterness, the hatred, all of those things, those sinful thoughts and actions that we've been a part of, all of those disappear standing before the love of the Lord and we will be overcome with love. The only thing that I can think of that would remotely be, can be compared to is the first time a mother holds her child in her arms for the first time. She forgets about all the pain, all the suffering, and only focuses on that beautiful child or, or the father holding his son or daughter for the first time. Uh, heaven, that's the beautiful part about it. As good as this life is, and this life is pretty awesome, I don't want to leave it. As good as this life is, we know that something better awaits us. I told my parents, I knew my grandmothers very, very well. They were saints to me, both of them, but I never knew my grandfathers. I cannot wait to meet my grandfathers and all, all of the angels and saints, all the saints that I've been especially close to during my lifetime and be part of that community of, of, of saints. This is very similar to what you just answered. Will we be able to see our earthly family when we die? Yes. Yes. The bishop will correct me if I'm not if I go into heresy. <laughs> yes. The love that I have for my parents is unique. It's different than the love I have for my siblings. The love I have for my siblings is different than the love I have for my nephews and nieces and my parishioners and my friends. When we come into the presence of God and are overcome by love, we will, it will be so forceful that we will only be confronted with love. And we will, we're in love with the Lord now, otherwise we wouldn't be here, right? We're all here because we love the Lord. When we come and see the face of love, God who is love, then we're going to be so overwhelmed with being in His presence that our, that our, our ancestors, saints, all of them beside us. Our love for them will begin to come away in this universal love that we all have for God. It's going to be, the church has always tried to teach us that we're all a family. We're not broken up by parishes. We're not broken up by dioceses. We're not broken up by congregations. We're not broken up. We are all one family. And we're going to find that out in heaven. We've had many questions about this. Um, how has Hospice of South Texas helped you during this transition? Uh, Deacon Steve probably could speak to death and dying a lot better than I can because he was a hospice chaplain for many years. And shortly before I went to, shortly before I went to, uh, uh, MD Anderson was put on hospice. About, I don't know, three days before he said, why don't you let me call Dr. Meyer and have him, have him talk to you? And I said, oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 that's for the dying people when I talk to us. <laughs> we'll talk to them later. And uh, he said, well, it's, that's really not the case. So, uh, so I told him I didn't need him. I don't want to talk to him. And when my MD Anderson doctor suggested hospice, then immediately I asked her to contact South, Hospice of South Texas. And uh, the other ones were building this beautiful facility right across from us for the our support here for, for hospice patients to die. So it's not to be a, uh, an emotional burden on the, on, the, on the family. But in any case, we get home. I went to Palacios to see mom and dad on the way home from the Anderson. And then by the time we reached home, two hours later, the hospice nurse was there, and she was. Uh, she answered questions that I didn't even know that I had, and she said that there was no, as we all say, there's no dumb questions. And 
and I was assigned a nurse, Dr. Meyer came to see me. And they met with my family, and their goal was to keep me as active as possible. You know, I said to myself, I can still go to the movies. I don't, but anyways, I could. <laughs> I don't do that either, but I could if I wanted to. I said, I don't think I really need hospice. And they all agreed that we're going to keep you as active as possible. Your pain, keep in front of your pain, and keep you living life as fully as possible and be there for you and your family uh, there to work, you know, with, throughout the process. So, hospice, God bless you. How do you put a smile on your face uh, knowing you are going to die in a few months? I have to go back to a story in Port Vaca with Sister sister Perpetua Haas. Everybody remembers her with great love and affection. Sister Perpetua and I were going in to see a retired Protestant minister who was dying. And uh, my thought was, what are we going to do when we get in there? I mean, offer a prayer, but I would think that you may be a little uncomfortable with a priest and a nun praying over her. But Sister, being an incredible woman, took over when we got in there. Much like Father Harold, she just said, you're going to see Jesus and everything you've been preaching about and everything you've been living your life for. It's going to be right there. You're going to see Jesus very, very soon. And uh, the family was waiting for us outside. We came out and prayed. With, we prayed with him and prayed over him. And came out and the sister said, he's going to see Jesus. He's going to see Jesus. And the family go, that's what? He is going to see Jesus. <laughs> and uh, I've thought about that story many, many times. And I, especially here lately, and I think that my consolation has been everything that I've been preaching, everything that I have hoped for for me and my family will come shortly for me. Uh, I keep a smile on my face because I have an incredibly blessed life. I have a life that I would have never had if it, if it were not for the church, if it were not for the priesthood, if it were not for the people of the parishes where I serve and people in our diocese, I can't imagine a life more full and more fulfilling. I only had 25 years of priesthood, but they have been 25 of the most incredible years that I could have ever hoped for. And uh, the beautiful thing about it is that the best is yet to come. So, in the beginning, in the beginning when I was put on hospice, I had a little anxiety or depression. I felt sorry for myself. I, I cried for myself in bed every night about myself, trying to hide that from my family and from the priest. And I said, I didn't want to get out of bed because I'm on hospice. And now I'm saying, I want to get out of bed because I'm on hospice. There's a lot to do. I have very little time left. And there's so much more to do. One of the beautiful things that I wanted to share with you, one of the graces of this has been, I'm going to take a break, I'll come back to the questions for a minute because I want to get to one thing. I want you to think for just a few seconds. What if you knew the day or the month and the year that you would die? What would you do differently in your life now that you're not already doing? Think about that for just for a second. If you were told you had less than three months to live, what would you do now in your life differently? I've asked that question over and over long before, long before I was ever ordained a priest, I was wondering. And even while I was ordained a priest, I kind of I had it all figured out. I would go to Europe, max out all my credit cards, <laughs> let my parents worry about it once, once, I, once we all got home. Because I wouldn't care at that point. And just really have a good time. Guess what happened the moment that I found out that I had less than six months to do? I wanted to pay all my bills. I wanted to stay at home. 
I wanted to spend time with my family, my cousins, the priests, and our seminarians. I wanted to live a quiet life here in the parish. I asked the bishop. He agreed and encouraged me to stay in the parish as long as possible. I kind of feel like I'm stealing from the parish because I don't do a lot of work nowadays. <laughs> I'm still getting the paycheck from the parish. I would ask you to think about that a little bit. And, and then I would ask you not to wait until you find out that you're dying. A lot of my kid pettiness and selfishness went away. A lot of my concern, Sister Perpetua also told me, Jesus lived without any human respect. He could care less if people liked him or hated him. It didn't affect his love for them, and his willingness to die for them and his obedience to the Father. And if we're not doing the, and if we're not doing the same thing, once again, we're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. If we're more concerned about what other people think of us than what God thinks of us, there's something wrong. Uh, okay, question. Sorry. Okay. Are you in a lot of pain? Have you had any apparitions or visions? And are you still hoping for a miracle? Uh, no, no, yes, yes. <laughs> Next question. Okay. Uh, I have, uh, yes, I have something. I've been, been uh, morphine and I have become very good friends here lately. And it's better living through chemistry, as I like to say. But the, I haven't had any visions, but I've had a lot of hallucinations. <laughs> ISIS was at, in my room the other day. <laughs> and I was trying to sleep. And you don't want ISIS in your room when you're trying to sleep. <laughs> so, I've, Dr. allowed me to come back on the morphine and, and the hallucinations, so I'm back to good holy dreams now. Uh, no visions. No visions. Uh, pain. These are, these are the blessings of my life right now. You never thought, for those of you who've known me for a long time, you never thought you'd hear me say this. I don't like food right now. I just don't like food. So I force myself to eat once a day. I force myself to eat. As a matter of fact, my classmates were very ugly to me in the seminary. We all made a coat of arms. I think it was a class below us. I won't blame the bishop on this. We all made a coat of arms and they had in Latin below it. And below mine was from St. Whose God is their stomach, you know? And I thought, oh, shoot. But in any case, uh, some people have shared some insights that they have received in prayer about me, and I would pre appreciate hearing that. Uh, the blessings that I have is that I force myself to eat once a day, so I'm staying hydrated and, and, and nourished. I, I, I'm sleeping well, and uh, my pain is manageable. And uh, uh, so with those three things, I feel extremely lucky, lucky because there's a lot of people, well people, well people who have trouble sleeping at night, trouble with chronic pain, and even trouble with, with, with diet issues. I feel very blessed. How does one prepare your family and the ones closest to you for the day the Lord calls you home? Well, my, my example had been my parents for a very long time. They were both cancer survivors and never in, in those many surgeries and chemos and radiation and everything else they go through, the, their recuperations never did either of them lose faith or despair. So, uh, in many ways, my family has prepared me. Ever since I was put on hospice, uh, my sisters, I have six sisters and two brothers, and my six sisters have divided the time, Sunday to Sunday, and have stayed with me all week and have uh, cooked and cleaned for the priest. And, uh, and I told them that I, I didn't really need them there until I got very, very ill. And they all told me that they wanted to be there, and this was part of their, their preparation as well. Uh, had, 
knowing how much time I have has been an incredible, incredible blessing because I can tell people that I love how much I love them. I can tell the people that I've hurt how sorry I am that I hurt them. I can let people know, like you, who have been so generous, exactly what you mean to me and how to keep you right here. Uh, that's been my only preparation. We thank God for knowing. It's just so many of our loved ones have gone before us, mark of faith, but gone before us without any any time to prepare. So this time of preparation has been especially important to me. Since we pray this this every day in the Holy Father, we all must have the need either to forgive or be forgiven. How has dying moved you to forgiveness? Well, once again, I've given up a lot of pettiness and a lot of the silly stuff that just really has nothing to do with the gospel. And it has no place in the church. I was reading some of the stuff Pope Francis has said on gossip in certain church circles, and he's pretty rough. He calls it the... Uh, uh, he re he referred to the, uh, the problem, uh, the issue of terrorism in the church. That when we start selling other people's good name and we pretend that, it, that it's part of our Christian belief and who we are as Christians, then it's, it just shows the hypocrisy of the church and that can't be a part of it. Uh, I failed to answer a question earlier. Am I still praying for a complete healing? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's no question about that. And I appreciate all the prayers and masses and everything that's been offered. And, and I will take a complete healing from the Lord, no problem. I'm not, not going <laughs> to turn it away. But I'm also that I, I've received so many other healings from the Lord that that it's kind of hard to demand anything else. I don't think I answered that last question, did I? You did fine. Okay. <laughs> okay, the next one is, I have a strong faith. If I ever become ill, I don't want to prolong life. Is it wrong to want to let go of this life? And then a similar one is, what is the church teaching on end of life, feeding tubes in the vegetative state. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're talking a little bit of medical ethics, and that's why it's important to contact your, your pastor whenever you're making important decisions. You know, the church used to talk about the ordinary and extraordinary means. The ordinary means being food, water, basic medicines, things like that. The extraordinary means uh, would go beyond that. And the ordinary man was always expected. But then the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, began to speak about proportionate and non-proportionate means. And so that's a, that's a whole science and theology, medical ethics. And, and we have people that, 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 and every case is different. So, you know, it's just not a matter of do we pull the plug or do we not pull the plug. There's nothing wrong with a natural death. It's a beautiful thing. In Guatemala, all of, all, the orphanage simply doesn't have the means to prolong life. And many, many lives that could be saved here in the United States are not able to be saved, but they have a very holy death. They're among the Franciscan priests and sisters. Um, so there's, a, there's, of course, uh, end of life uh, declarations and things like that. And uh, I've actually built some of that stuff into my legal documents and my, my family can make those kind of decisions. Uh, but for specific situations, it's, it, that, that's a whole other class in science. Uh, you do not have to go beyond proportionate means to save your own, uh, or your family doesn't have to go beyond proportionate means to save your own life. Uh, but just get with your pastor if you encounter a difficult situation like that. This has been asked several times, um, but, and I know you said you didn't want to talk about it, but you know, I don't always listen. Can you explain purgatory? Okay. What I remember from my Catholic school days, sometimes I feel like I might be stuck there forever. Yes. <laughs> I'll meet you there forever. <laughs> yeah, we'll organize meeting, we'll do everything. <laughs> For me, purgatory is one of the most compassionate teachings in the church. In the, Second book of Maccabees in the, in the 12th chapter, it speaks about praying for the dead so they, that they might rise. 
And there's been a tradition in the church to pray for our beloved dead and go for masses for them. And we are expected to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Raise your hand if you're perfect here. Okay. So, listen to what I have to say here, okay? So that's why we stay regular for the sacraments, confession, and mass. That's why we try to live the gospel as rapidly as possible. But even though we were love of the Lord and we seek to serve the Lord with an undivided heart, we're very imperfect people. And if if that's the expectation, then there has to be a time of purification, of cleansing of the soul, so that when we inherit eternal life, we we come into this world, say original sin, but we come into this world and we're baptized and we're made pure and saints and children of God. And then we go through our life and sometimes our sometimes our lives take us in very uh, difficult uh, directions. And sometimes we wander far from the Lord. And so and that includes that includes priests and religious and deacons. That includes all of us. Uh, we too are sinners. And so for me, purgatory is one of the most compassionate teachings of the church. It's when we find ourselves far from perfection. And we still need to make reparation even for the sins that have been forgiven in our that we do so appropriately before we encounter the beatific vision of seeing God face to face. Okay, what is your most what is your most what is your most what is your most I'm gonna think about that when we come back to you because I'm flooded with memories right now. So you think about it and make sure you ask that question later. Okay. I'm going to... It's almost an hour to you, Father, just, oh. just so you know. Okay. Can we go another 10 minutes? Is that okay? Okay. I've got a minute. Could you go another... Oh. Uh, okay. Do you think God has given you this past to help people understand cancer and what it does to a person's life and their family? You fill in the blank. Cancer, diabetes, COPD, arthritis. You fill in the blank with some cross that the Lord has asked you or loved one to give. Or loved one to give. Is it a curse from God? I don't think so. It's yet another cross that we've been asked to, to carry. A young man from Puerto Rico came to me and I was, I was never in remission, but I didn't want to tell him that because he thought I was in remission. And he said, what prayer do you pray in order to get into remission? And I said, well, there's no prayer. And I said, and well, I felt sorry for him because he, he was like me. He was never going to be healed from what ailed him. And I tried to talk to him about the ultimate healing for all of us. We can experience some sort of healing in our life, but in the end, at the end of our lives, we're going to go to, we're going to stand before God. And the goal of our life as Christians is to go to heaven. You know, I can ask you all, who wants to go to heaven? Everybody raises their hand. Then I ask you, who wants to die? And they all call their hands to heaven. <laughs> you can't have one without the other. Okay? Eventually, my parents are 87 years old. I thought I would be marrying them. I'm not going to marry them. They're going to marry me. But we know with all that they've gone through, they know with all that I've gone through, that no matter how many times healing comes my way, eventually we all must die. And that's why they baptized me. And that's why I became a priest. And that's why I believe. And that's why I come to Mass. And that's why I go to confession. So it's not, it's not a failure not being healed. There's another goal. Do you believe people can come back to us in spirit or visit us as spirits? Well, we know that there have been certain apparitions and times gone by. We have to make distinction between public revelation and private revelation. There, there, there aren't that many church-approved public revelations when it comes to 
apparitions. We know them. I lay a lot of them there, I your words. Sacred Heart of Jesus to St. Mary Margaret Alcock. All of those things have been approved by the church. A number of people have come to me and, and told me stories about loved ones coming back. And I think it's a beautiful story. But I also think it's a private revelation. If that happens, God is trying to speak to your heart. In one case, I told the mother, the lady, God is trying to tell you everything that you taught your children. Everything that you believe is true. This is what this apparition, apparition tells you. It's all true. It's not make-believe. The resurrection is not make-believe. The gospel is not a beautiful story. It's absolute. It's true. There's a place waiting for us. And if you've had that experience, then don't try to make a big deal out of it and invite people into your home to see whatever's going on. Realize the Lord is speaking to your individual heart. What role has our Blessed Mother oh. played through your journey with cancer? I realize there, there, there are a lot of Christians who have no devotion to Mary, and that's completely understandable. Uh, it's not mandated by the gospel. But I have always been close to my mother, I've been close to my grandmothers, I've been close to my sisters. And the role of Mary in my life has given me so much consolation when those very, very important women in my life can't be there. The Blessed Mother is there. And for so many people who pray the rosary daily, we have a devotion to Our Lady. Right now, I'm, I'm extremely excited about the image of Mary at the foot of the cross, the sorrowful mother. And that brings me so much consolation. So Mary is, has always been a very important part of our life. Every time we would go to town, we would pray, depending, if we weren't in school, it's just three Hail Marys, and we would pray on the way to school. But if we had to go to Bay City, we had to pray the entire rosary. <laughs> Sometimes we took our poor little Protestant friends with us, and they would say, is this the long one or the short one? <laughs> and I said, make yourself comfortable. We weren't basically, this is the long one. <laughs> so we all learned the rosary. What could you say to someone who says, why me? about God and what awaits us and the consolation that faith offers all of us in whatever suffering or whatever cross we embrace. So it's, I don't know that I really ask that question very much. I'll tell you what I, I, I do say is thank you Lord for it not being my parents. Thank you Lord for it not being my sisters, my brothers. Thank you Lord for it not being my nephews and nieces. Uh, so I really I really haven't uh, seen this as a, as, a, as a real curse from God, so I really haven't asked that question. Maybe I should start. I'm going to start tonight. <laughs> Have you come up with your most memorable moment as a priest yet? I love being a priest. I absolutely love sitting in the confessional. I love being behind the altar. I love baptizing babies. I love instructing people in the faith. If I could have done a better job at it, I wish I, I wish uh, I would have had the strength to do a better job of it. Uh, I have to say, celebrating the sacraments for me has been the greatest uh, part of my life. Period. What made you not want to continue treatment? Did uh, you feel like God has already healed you? God has healed me. There's no question. In so many ways, I've been a broken man, and I feel so good. People say, Father, you look so good. I feel good. And it's because of the prayers are so many of you. Don't think it's only because of the good work of the doctors. There's some, the doctors are praying for me. The, the people in the parishes are praying for, praying for me. The, uh, uh, so God has already healed me. And I'm going to receive the ultimate healing when I see God face to face in heaven. So when God, how do I have a smile on my face? Because I'm going to get to see Jesus before you get to see Jesus. Who are angry at God because their loved one is 
story. If anybody can take our anger, it's God. Okay? You yell at me, I'm going to yell at you back. And the next time you try to come say something nice to me, I'm still going to yell at you back. Because okay? I hold grudges. We can go and scream to God, why me? Why my mother? Why my child? Why now? Why aren't you answering my prayers? Scream to the Lord. Those are, that's what the Psalms are all about. When you read through the Psalms, you hear people expressing their deepest emotions and feelings. And they're beautiful and very powerful prayers. But we will always come back to the consolation of God. Remember how we used to fight as kids and then our parents used to make us they force us to make up with each other. Okay? Eventually it all happens. If we're serious about our faith, then we're going to want to make up with, with, even with God. And so, in those moments that I have yelled at God, and I have despaired, I went to confession, and I, I asked the Lord's forgiveness for being, my faith being so limited. So if you feel like yelling at God, yell at God. Okay? He can take it. But then go back to Him and kiss and make up. Now, actually, there's, okay. it's not really a question, it's okay. a request. Okay. Um, would you please give us your blessing? Absolutely. I want to say, let me, uh, let me just, let me just put a few of my notes since I didn't use any. I, I prepared some stuff just in case. And these are some things that I've been thinking about for myself, and if they apply to you, so be it. Be good to those nearest to you. In a former parish, the secretary, my parish secretary, was visiting with people outside, and they were about to thought people were grabbing her, and she was so sweet. Her husband comes to ask, ask for the keys, and she turns around and chews him out. And I said, if you ever treat any of my parishioners the way you treat your husband, you'd be fired. Okay? So be, be good to those nearest to you. I find myself barking at my family far too often when I'm not feeling well. See each day that we receive as a, as a gift. And when the little kids ask you, will you go play outside with me? Go we'll play outside with me. You have time to express your love? Do it. Watch your tongue. Some things can't be taken back, ever. The song reminds us, as the song says, set a guard over my mouth and keep, a, keep watch over the door of my lips. Express contrition, not only to God, but to each other. Review everything that you were taught as a child. Those lessons were so important. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. There are a lot of people who have it much worse than you. Don't allow others to take away the joy and the peace that a relationship with the Lord gives you. Prayer of St. Francis that I want to end with, very simply, let nothing disturb you. Excuse me, St. Francis. St. Teresa of Avila, Big Teresa. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. All things are passing away. God never changes. Patient, patience obtains all things. Whoever has God lacks nothing, for God alone suffices. And before I give the blessing, I just want to just recognize how many people here are from Holy Family. Raise your hand. Okay. How many people here are from other parishes in, in, the, in the city? Okay. Anybody from uh, my former parishes in Calvin County? Uh, here we go. And Frostburg and Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and how about family? Is there any of my family here? All the extended family. Okay. Well, you aren't so much. The extended family, not all of them. The extended family is invited to the rectory right after. Okay, I'll ask you to remain seated as we ask God's blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you share with us in our life. We thank you, Lord, most of all for the gift of our faith, for what awaits us in the life to come, and for the consolation that you offer in this life. That we experience suffering and hardship. We know that your love and your mercy is in this. We ask, Lord, for patience in all things. 
Help us to remember that you hold us in the very palm of your hand and help us to offer all that we are and all that we hope to be. We offer it to you and for the good of the world. We ask these in all prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Again, thank you to all. Thank you to the bishop. Thank you to the women religious, our priests who have gathered. Uh, Father Jacob and Father Martin's been to be with us. But for those priests who have really, the, the, the local priests here in Victoria who have helped me when I've not been able to do my job, they've, they've, they've stepped in. So God bless you all for coming. Thank you.